Welcome to the Peace of Me podcast. This is your space for all things peace, positivity, and finding balance to live your best life. Life gets busy and at times it's messy. I'm here to help you clean things up and put peace back in its place. I'll share tips, ideas, interviews, mindset shifts, and fresh perspectives to help you along the way. If you missed your chance to win a coffee on me during Free Coffee Fridays, well, you're in luck. I still have a discount code for you. The Peace of Me podcast partnered with Java Sock to give a handful of listeners an iced coffee Java Sock and a free cup on me. I drink iced coffee year-round and just rotate the coffee creamer flavors to keep it festive and fun. If you didn't win the contest, you can still score a 10% off discount by using my code LEXI82172. I'll put this code in the show notes of this episode below so you too can keep your cup cozy through the season. Hi friends, it's Lexi Lee. If you're new here, welcome. And if you're not new, then welcome back and thanks for coming back to the podcast. Please do me a quick favor and hit the follow button on the top of your podcast page to let me know that you're out there. In the podcast world, when you hit publish on an episode, it just kind of goes out into the dark space of the internet and you don't really know who is listening on the other side. So by hitting that follow button, it just lets me know that you're out there and supporting the show. And speaking of dark spaces, that's exactly what today's episode is all about. It's October. Now, I don't know where this year has gone, but here we are. We are now in the full swing of fall. The kids have been back to school for some time now. Pumpkins are probably getting picked up and carved, and we are close to Halloween. I love Halloween. I look forward to the decorations, the scary movies, the candy, the costumes, and the dressing up. It's such a fun time of year, and it's probably one of my favorite holidays. Now, because of that, I wanted to bring some fun to the podcast by bringing in a paranormal expert, also known as a ghost hunter. Now, today's guest is Mark Arvilla. He's a demonologist who's been chasing ghosts for 13 years. He uses different technologies to capture voices from the other side. But we didn't just talk about the voices he picked up from the dead. We also talked about signs from loved ones, dreams, and other paranormal phenomena. And as we recorded, some strange things happened to my audio too. The recording froze a couple of times, and I don't record on Wi-Fi, and our lights flickered at the same exact time when we live many, many miles apart on completely different utility grids. Strange? Ironic? Well, only you can decide. Now, Mark will also talk about being safe this Halloween when playing with the paranormal in case you are feeling brave and want to contact the dead yourself. Now, this will be a two-part episode, so come back next week to hear the rest of our conversation where he shares his wildest experience using Ouija boards and even more. Let's take a listen. Hi, Mark. Welcome to the Peace of Me podcast. Hey, Lexi. Thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. And I'm so excited to have you on the podcast this month because this is something that we really haven't done before. So before we dive into all the fun questions that come with kind of the season of all the spookiness and all the good stuff, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself first? I'd be happy to. So first of all, my name is Mark Arvilla. I am a paranormal investigator. And uh, a lot of people will say, what? And then the next thing I say, well, I'm a ghost hunter. And then they go, oh, okay, a ghost hunter. So if anybody's ever watched any of those TV shows, I'm not going to name them as we're talking, but they're out there. People can watch them on the, on the proper channels. They, um, What you see on TV is exactly what I do. I go into people's homes. I go into big locations. I bring a bunch of equipment with me, and I try to uh, capture evidence that there's something else out there other than what we see every day. So how long have you been doing this? I've been doing this about uh, 13 years now. I started in 2010 is when I started. So it's been about 13 years, about seven or eight years ago, eight years ago now, I kind of started to level myself up, if you will, as a paranormal investigator. And my actual title now is a demonologist. So uh, we can talk about that a little bit later if you'd like, but it's uh, been a pretty interesting path. I've had uh, some really 
cool interactions with people and the other side and everything in between. And it's just, it, yeah, it's life is strange sometimes. And some people are afraid of what I talk about, but other people are super intrigued. So very cool. And maybe it's a little ironic that this is your 13th year. Isn't like 13 kind of one of those numbers, right? Is it that ironic? Is. <laughs> it is. You know, you know, it's funny. I don't know if anybody's, no, no, I keep talking about religion. But if you look at the picture of the Last Supper, it was actually 13 people at the table. So that's uh, it's supposed mm. to be, that's where it's supposed to have started. But yeah. <laughs> oh, wasn't that interesting? So you uh, mentioned how, okay, so you got into this 13 years ago. I guess what made you say, you know what, this is something I want to do? It's a great question. So when I started uh, even becoming curious about this, it was because I was watching those TV shows that I just mentioned. I remember sitting at home, watching it on TV and just saying to myself, I can't believe they actually do this. At the time I'm thinking for a living, you know, my God, people actually go out looking to discover ghosts and things like that for a living. But you know, as I've come to know, it's not really a paying job unless you actually end up on TV. Uh, you do a lot of more pro bono stuff for people. Um, you know, I, I, I've had over the years a lot of different opinions that I'll get into in a little bit about uh, about this field, I guess you will, if you'll call it that. But I, uh, I did. I started watching the TV shows. I was curious about if it was real or not. And it seemed, you know, underproduced at the time. Now it's very overproduced when you watch the shows. So I had an opportunity back in, I think it was what, 2010. Yeah. We had an opportunity to go on a paranormal investigation uh, with some of the people that were on the TV shows. The tickets were like a hundred dollars. There was a like well-known location in Massachusetts. That's now unfortunately unavailable to everybody. But they were doing an event there. You went to sit with them, get a little bit of a lecture. And then for four hours, you got to investigate till like one o'clock in the morning with them in the building. So I bought my first digital recorder on the ride out, three hour ride from Gloucester, Massachusetts, out to North Adams, Mass. Bought my first digital recorder and uh, didn't know what to expect and had a blast doing it. Thought I was going to be scared, but I wasn't. And actually caught a little bit of evidence. To this day, one of my all-time favorite EVPs, which is, stands for Electronic Voice Phenomena, that's when you don't hear something with your ears but capture it on a recorder. One of my favorite EVPs came from that night, and it was when one of the gentlemen who was running the event was speaking. He was addressing the, the spirits or ghosts in the room, and he was telling them how they can speak to us, you know, telling them not to be frustrated. And I still use this method today. So just telling them, listen, if you're talking and we're not responding, don't be frustrated. We have this equipment around the room or tools that you can speak to. They have little lights on them and we'll be able to respond later or hear your voice later. And when he said that, and there was a little pause when he said, after they said the lights on them, I caught an actual EVP that said right there, it was a whisper right into the microphone of my recorder. And I can re vividly remember where I was standing at that time. And I was not next to somebody who would whisper into my recorder. And uh, that got me hooked. And I started my own team and went and I learned more about it and then started helping people after that. Wow. So I'm curious. I think you said there was a group of you that went to that recording or that session, I guess. So did anybody else like pick up on that? Like, did anybody else get that voice? Was it just you or? Just, just me, which I've come again over the years. I've come to learn that a, like a true EVP will be something that you can have five recorders in the room and only one of them will pick it up and the other four won't. And I can't explain again. Scientifically, I can't explain why. I have no idea why it happens to a particular recorder, sometimes more than others. Um, and whether it's the frequency they're recording at or whatever it might be, the white noise that's built into it, I still don't know. And that's why this field will never be, I don't want to say never, right now can never be considered a science because we don't have those controls. We cannot duplicate, like in a lab, like they can duplicate something over and over again. We can't do that. So unfortunately for us, it's become sort of, a, well, it doesn't exist if you can't duplicate it. Um, but that, that to me, I, I have a, a, a great story about that same scenario where I was investigating, um, 
a building in Salem, Mass., with a gentleman named Nick Roth. And people might know Nick from several different TV shows he's had. He's currently on TV now, too. Nick and I were with a few people uh, investigating in a building. And we were, he was using a recorder that does uh, real-time playback on it. So you can only – it only captures uh, a recording when there's something talking. So if it's dead silence, there should be no recording. It should just go from your last question to the next question to the next question. There should be nothing in between. And when he played back that recording, he had spoken uh, – was saying something about um, – and knowing it takes a lot of energy to communicate with us and things like that. And in the pause he had after that, there was a, a voice that came through and said, I'm exhausted now. And I, we listened to it and he kind of looked at me because it almost sounded like my voice. And he kind of looked at me and I'm like, Nick, I know better than the talk in between the questions. And he goes, no, I know. He goes, I, and we all sort of just, we listened over and over. And there's no doubt it said, I'm exhausted now. And I went home. I had a recorder going the entire time. So I went to that part where he captured that and there was nothing on my recorder, just absolute silence. And on his recorder, he had captured, I'm exhausted now. So no, that way there, that validates that nobody in the room said it. Otherwise my recorder would have captured it also, but his captured that voice that, and, and it was clear as day. It was not scratchy and muffled that you could be like, Oh, it's just a noise. And you're interpreting as, as words. So, again, these things as to why one recorder captures it and the next one doesn't um, is just still, it's a mystery to us, but it's still something we experiment with to find out how we can start narrowing it down more and more and more so that, you know, maybe everybody's using, and that's, you don't want to really shoebox yourself that way, but maybe everybody can start using the right equipment and better equipment. And when you did that, you didn't hear, like, you didn't hear anything in the room. You didn't hear that voice. It was just only captured on the recording. Correct. Yep. Only on the recording. That's if you hear wild. it with your natural ear, we call it a disembodied voice. So, and, and I've heard those. I've been, that same building that I told you that I said my first investigation at, that I went for the event, I visited many times after that. And uh, in the basement, there's, a, there's uh, stories about a little girl's spirit. And that little girl spirit, I've heard her voice in that, in the open, in the basement. And it's, uh, it's, I get kind of emotional when I talk about this, this particular location, because I did interact with that spirit many, many times and I have my own children. So when I think about a little girl spirit being caught in one spot, um, and that now nobody goes there, nobody. And I know that those spirits are still there and nobody gets to go to this location and interact with them anymore. Um, I wonder, you know, do they, are they aware? Do they know that nobody comes to them anymore? Do they, do they miss that? Does it, does it not matter to them? Are they gone? So it's very, it's intriguing to me to I really want to get back in there just to see what mm -hmm. has happened and what's different and how crazy the activity would be. Would they recognize me? Would they know? Cause I've been there well over a dozen times. So there's, there's, interactions that we were getting where we could amplify and ramp up based off of our last investigation. Um, but there are some great teams out there that do work like that. And this is something that not a lot of people know. They watch the TV shows, they see what happens on TV and it's always okay. On to the next, you know, next, next big location, next home that we go to. But there are actually teams that are doing case studies at locations around I, I, probably the world where they spend almost a, every day some sort of recording or evidence at a location that's known to be haunted. And they build off of that every single day where they find a, a new name or they find a pattern happening where they can almost predict, Hey, this is, we're going to hear this at this time, or mm -hmm. it really starts to, to build. And I think that that's really going to be the next level for our field is, not running around chasing ghosts. It's now trying to figure out where the patterns are and why this specific location or this specific area has that activity and how we can, you know, either help it or just document it or whatever needs to be done. So I've heard something and I might be jumping around here because I don't know as much about this stuff, but I do believe in a lot of it, which we'll probably get into. But um, I've heard things like 
if you're able to communicate with a spirit or an energy or whatever they might call it, it's because it hasn't quite transitioned to the other side. Like it's kind of stuck in this like space where it's not here. It's not there. It's kind of in this in between. Is that true? Is that why you're able to hear voices or kind of interact? It's because it's not where it needs to be that it's kind of in this like middle space, if that makes sense. And that makes total sense. And I, my belief has become over the years that, um, I don't think anything is, I don't want to say, I don't, isn't, there aren't spirits that are trapped or, or captured or held back. But I believe that everything crosses and transitions. Like our essence, if you will, I think that goes. No matter what, mm -hmm. that moves along. The energy we leave behind, our consciousness sticks around. Our consciousness mm -hmm. is still in an area that maybe we don't. This is why I think that sometimes somebody has a hard time because they can't communicate with a loved one or they don't get the signs that they want or mm -hmm. they never come through when they go to a psychic or something like that. That part of, of this equation is difficult because I think some of us choose to stick around and try and communicate mm -hmm. and some don't. Their, their consciousness goes elsewhere because they were at peace or done with what they needed to do here. Um, that's why a lot of times when there's been a tragedy, uh, there's a lot of uh, activity in a place like that because I think there was unfinished business. Their their consciousness is still caught in this bubble where they are, are confused about why they're not living anymore or why it happened and are trying to communicate a way or act out a way that they can find answers and nobody has those answers that they can easily give to them and so I, I think that there are pieces that stick around, um, mm -hmm. pieces of me, if you will. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm just starting here. I just heard it. So sorry if that starts coming through, but these are the things that no, that's I, fine. I wish we had all the answers for. I wish we could, I wish we, we had a blueprint that we could say, well, when you die, this happens and then this happens and then this happens. Psychics will tell you that. A psychic medium will tell you, what the, the transition from here to the afterlife is. But I don't know that I'm not a psychic medium. So I don't know what it's like to make that connection to make that communication. Mm -hmm. So for me, when they tell me definitively, this is what happens and moves on. I have lots of questions. I have what's mm -hmm. and why's and, and, you know, is it every spirit that does this? Well, then, then if that's the case, then why does this spirit not move on? And why are you still able to communicate with them? And so I, th I think that there's a natural transition to another plane that happens. And then there's also a consciousness that allows us to be able to interact. And I find that if you're trying to communicate with a spirit, without anything happening. If, if I, if you never had something happen in your home, uh, a, a noise, a, a reason to think that your house is occupied by something other than you, then I'm not going to come in and be able to capture some evidence of that because that person person or that spirit doesn't want me to, they, they don't want to communicate. They don't want to interact with everybody. So they're gone. They're, they've moved along and are just, maybe, it, maybe there's another, level of life that we have to achieve. Um, mm -hmm. There's a, a gentleman named James Van Prague, who's a very well-known psychic medium. He actually was a producer on the show, The Ghost Whisperer. That's why there's a lot of things in that show that are fairly valid for um, experiences people have had. But James Van Prague, I've gone to him twice and watched his gallery readings. And James has that belief. He His... his interaction is that we are just a piece of a tether. Like if you mm -hmm. can imagine a tether from you going up to wherever, and once you've done everything you need to do and you pass on, you're going to level up. You're going to go on to the next stage of, of your evolution, if you will. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that is to repeat something that maybe you didn't quite learn or do properly while you were here, you might have to repeat it. Or if you accomplished everything spiritually needed to, now you move on to another level and another plane. So that's, I think, that's a very comforting and easy way to sort of think about where we're going. Once you're done here, there's now another spot that you've got to go. 
and you have more work to do and more things to, to accomplish. So. And I would agree with you because I, at least my belief is that our bodies are just a shell and our energy goes somewhere. And, um, so you said something and I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to share a little story. I've actually never told this to anybody. So this is a, I guess this is a vulnerable moment. So my mom passed away a few years ago, a couple of nights ago, I had the wildest, wildest dream and she's in the dream and she's talking to me. And I said, mom, I said, how are things going? I said, have you seen your family? Are you having a good time? And you know, your friends and family there. And in the dream, she says to me, I can hear them, but I can't like see them. Like she, she was basically like, I, I can hear their voices in the room. I know they're around me, but I haven't had a chance to be with them yet. And this is in the dream. And in the dream, I'm like, well, that's because you're with me right now. Like you're too busy on the wrong side. Once you finally get to the other side, you're going to see them. You're going to be with them. And it was like, it was such a real, like it was one of those dreams I woke up and I was like, wow, that was so real. And it was so lifelike. But then I thought about it and I'm like, it kind of makes sense. Like, because I mean, maybe it's my brain, but believing that she wasn't quite on the other side, she was kind of on this side with me, which is why she couldn't see the other people who have already passed on. So I, I definitely believe that. Like, I think there's like an energy that goes on and the, our bodies are just a shell to kind of, you know, get us around and go from point A to point B, I guess, you know? Yeah. You, um, yeah, it's interesting. You, that's a, that's a very deep in emotionally, charge the dream that you had so i don't i'm of that i'm of the belief that thing dreams like that aren't dreams that you did have mm. an interaction with your mom because our brains don't shut off when we go to sleep they continue working so mm -hmm. your dream state is just sort of when your eyes are shut off and everything else your dream state is still your brain working doing its thing but now you have an opportunity to maybe tap into some of that so mm -hmm. I have a friend who's doing certain things in the field that are um, involving the stages of someone passing and oh. they're very deep into it where they almost can draw a map of, you know, if, if a spirit is kind of needing some help along the way, how they can help them along the way. And it's interesting because what you just described to me is one of the things we've talked about. Where, oh, you're kidding. You know, no, it's it, that's why I'm. I, I kind oh, of wow! Like, oh, I'm glad I shared that. This, then <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those steps where um, there can be a little bit, uh, not so much confusion, but sort of a why do I hear them but I don't see them right now? Um, mm. You know, almost so, almost as if a ghost is being haunted itself. You know, so we're mm. here. Sometimes people have stories about hearing things in their houses or apartments. Mm -hmm. And they're like, I hear them, but I can't see them. And we've often wondered, does that happen to spirits too? Do we oh. have that where they're confused and they're saying, well, I hear you, you know? So there's a famous episode of, of one of the shows that they were at a, the uh, Mount Washington hotel up in New Hampshire. And there's a room up there called the princess room. And the princess has been known to uh, act out, if you will, or at least make herself known in that, in that room. And they mm -hmm. captured a recording where they said, you know, princess, are you here? The response was, well, of course I'm here. Where are you? But they got to that question. So that is another one of those, are they living out another part of life mm -hmm. and are now our voices come through or other deceased members come through. And now they're thinking I'm haunted because they're living on a different plane than we are, but they're still living. They're still going through that life again. And mm -hmm. here we are trying to communicate with them because now we've crossed over that, that veil, if you will, or that line. And are we haunting them now? So that dream you had where you're talking to your mom and she's like, yeah, but I hear them, but I don't see them yet. I think it's a very real thing and is uh, it's interesting that you had that experience and, you know, um, I, my mom passed a couple of years ago too, and I haven't heard a peep from her. So <laughs> I, See, I, I was going to ask there. you that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's really interesting. Cause I've, I've had, okay, so this is, we're probably going down the wrong path here, but, and we're, but I'm sure it's all tied <laughs> together, but I have, I have dreams about my mom every single night, every single night. They're not like, I know there's, there's dreams, there's visions, there's visits, there's all kinds of things, but 
it's, and, and some of them are so real. And I did have something that happened like within 48 hours after her passing that was like, could not, um, it wasn't, it wasn't a dream. I was awake when it happened. So like, there's no way to like, I don't know, I guess argue it, but, um, but that's interesting too, because I've heard like my, my sister, she's like, no, nope. like some things will happen in the family. Like there's certain things that happen that it's like, well, that was kind of weird, but you know, she doesn't really have, like, she doesn't have the dreams that I have. So you just mentioned you haven't had it. Like here you are, you're very connected to, I guess, the energy, the spirit world, but yet you haven't gotten any personal visits yourself. So why is that, that some people it happens to and other people it doesn't? I think that there are some people who need, um, need to have that connection. And I think, I don't want to say, I don't want to say that like emotionally you need to have that connection because we all miss our loved ones. We all grieve when you know, I, I still miss my mom every day. Mm-hmm. Um, there are times where I'll leave work and I'll, I'll have like, something great that has happened to me and I hop in my car and I want to call my mom and I'm like, I can't, I yeah. can't call her. It stinks. Me. So yeah. it does stink. It does. And I think there are others that need spiritually to have that happen to them where maybe they, they just need to have that reassurance or that visit that you don't consciously know you need to have. You feel like, mm. you know, geez, I, I, I didn't said everything I needed to say. There's no, why, why am I having this type of a dream? And there's probably just psychologically a deeper layer to that because mm-hmm. maybe you didn't grieve enough or maybe this didn't happen and, and you held everything back a little bit. So I think that's when the, the points happen. Um, I had, to my, to my side, to, for, for what happened to me, although I, I would love, I, I kind of want to, but I kind of don't want to hear from my mom because I know it would just be an extremely emotional thing for me. Mm-hmm. But before my mom passed, um, almost, uh, it wasn't a year. It was, it was well, yeah, it, might, it was a little over a year probably before my mom passed. My mom passed mm-hmm. in uh, 2021. And in 2020, when COVID hit, she was in a nursing home. So they were the first ones to get locked down. Mm. And when they did, I remember, if you remember back to when COVID first started, nobody knew what was happening. Mm-hmm. People were dropping dead left and right. And as far as we knew, we could all die. It could, it could happen to you or I walking into a grocery store. So yeah. I just remember there was a lot of fear in everybody at that time. And my mother and I had a conversation with each other where um, I'm going to get a little emotional. Sorry. That's okay. Um, (laughs) I got to tell my mom that she was the greatest mom anybody could have. And I told her all of the things we basically said goodbye to each other just in case, because we were seeing that, you know, people weren't able to have their loved ones come visit them and be there when they passed. And we got to say all of the things we needed to say to each other. And, she told me what a great son I was, and um, we kind of said goodbye then. So when my mom did eventually pass in 2021, nothing COVID-related. Um, it was it was actually uh, her two-year anniversary just passed. Mm. Um, she and I had nothing left unsaid. You know, we had said it all to each other. And two weeks before she passed, about two weeks, she had decided to put herself in hospice. She told my sister she wanted to go into hospice, that she was tired. And we, um, you know, we we took it as awful as we possibly could, but it was her decision. And um, they took her off all her medicines and things like that. They had uh, morphine for her just in case she didn't have cancer, but it was there for pain or anything resulted with taking her off her medicines. And two weeks later, she was just gone. She went to sleep and that was it. And, uh, it's, it was amazing to know that she just knew. So Hmm. I really think that for my side, she was just complete peace and a complete rest and had nothing left that she had to worry about or had to do. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember driving to Massachusetts and about probably about half an hour, maybe or 45 minutes before I got to her, she passed away. And, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm for certain she did that because she didn't want me to see her dying. So mm. it's, a, it's just, it is what it is, you know, but I, um, yeah. I do wish I could have something to know that she's moved, but at mm-hmm. the same time, I don't need it. I know 
through what I do, I know I don't need that. And, um, you know, I know someday I will, some, I don't, I don't want to make it like religious because I don't necessarily believe that you, there's a heaven and hell. Like we've been told, I do believe that there's another air spot, another place that we go, just whether it's on the same earth and just a plane that we can't see or whatever it is, I do believe there's a blip in time that happens mm-hmm. where you do move on. And I, I, I have, I want to say I have evidence of this because I have, um, there's a book that my mentor wrote. The book is called Demon Haunted. And at the end of the book, the last chapter of that book is about communications that myself and other investigators at that time were having with uh, his deceased uncle. And his deceased uncle was very well known. His, uh, if you've ever watched any of the movies about The Conjuring, their characters, his, he and his wife's characters are portrayed in the movies. Um, it was Ed and Lorraine Warren. And Ed um, passed away, oh my God, probably 20 years ago now. We're getting that. Yeah, it's got to be around 20. But Ed's been dead for a while. He's, he's passed. And he started coming through to some investigators. And we, I had recordings of his voice. I had recordings uh, of him talking. And I, I passed those on to John for verification. And he val- validated that. He's like, that's my uncle. And I said, I know. <laughs> and I don't know oh why. Oh, my gosh. So to me, this was like our holy grail. This is like what we've been looking for as investigators. Somebody who we all knew living, who is now deceased, who is communicating on the devices that he used and we use, and giving us validation that it's him through living relatives that recognize the voice and recognize things they're saying and stories that are are coming through and making sense to this person. So that is to me, incredible validation uh, for the fact that, yeah, there is something else. So my, when people ask me, do you think there's, you know, why do you believe in all this? Why do you believe there's another realm? I've had that validation. I've had that where, the people I know in my own ears have heard the voice of somebody who is no longer here. And that is not possible. That is not something that I could be using a recorder, not here with my own ears. There's mm-hmm. not going to be a radio station coming through my recorder. Nothing is going to come through. And this person was doing the work that we do and is now giving us that little piece to let us know keep going because you're, you're not doing it for nothing. And there's, there's something here. And there was a, a period of time where I really felt that he was helping facilitate communications or helping now the other side, the spirits get stories over to us or things that need to be said over to us a little easier, like giving them the roadmap of how to communicate rather than us trying to figure it all out. So and what um, was he saying? Like, what did you pick up on in those recordings? So it started for me um, over several investigations where I would just keep hearing the same name. He would be saying his name. And um, I, for me at first, I didn't pay attention to anything else that was being said after that because I'd hear the name and I'm like, you know, I'm doing, I'm trying to investigate somebody's home and this name comes through and I'm looking at them saying, does Ed make any sense to you? And they're like, no. And so I'm, I'm getting sidetracked off my investigation because now I'm thinking, well, why is this name coming through? And, and it's, through, it's not through just a regular digital recorder. I record everything that we do. So my digital recorder may capture a spirit voice on it, but it might be also at the same time I'm using other equipment that we can try to use to communicate with spirits also. So it's almost like a backup to what we're actually doing. Mm-hmm. And I was using a, a cell phone app, which I know people are going to be like, a phone app? Come on. How, do, how can you talk to the dead with a phone app? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I don't have the answer for it. I was one of the very first people to ever use this app. I know the creator of the app. I do not get paid royalties for him selling his app. I paid for the app myself. <laughs> so get that out of the way. When 
this gentleman created this app called Echo Vox, which you can go on the Google Play Store or Apple and you can get it yourself. You, I had a communication happen with a client of mine's uh, family where his father came through and I had no idea what his father's voice sounded like. I didn't know his father. It was a, it was a, I was investigating their home. One of the claims was he thought there was a voice coming through um, the smoke detector in his house. So I showed oh, wow. up at the investigation. I know first thing I'm thinking is, how does a voice come through your smoke detector? So I asked the right questions. Is it one of those smoke detectors that says words like fire, fire, fire? Well, yeah. Okay. So there's a speaker in the smoke detector. It's not just going to sound an alarm. There's an actual speaker. Now I have a little bit of, okay, that makes it a little bit more plausible to me that something else could come through the speaker. That's all you need is that source. So as the investigation is going on, I explained to him I have this app that I can use on my phone. Basically what it is is a a random soup of words. Two people sat down, they read an Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe book, They took that reading, they chopped it up into nothing more than one syllable words and put it into a random program. So it's just a random soup of of words that comes out and you'll never pick up a sentence or you shouldn't, and you shouldn't pick up more than a one syllable word. So as we began using this tool and a woman comes through, he looks at me and goes, that's the woman's voice that I've heard. And I said, okay. Ask some questions. You're the one who experiences this. You ask the questions. So he starts asking who it is. And he goes, he goes, this is going to sound crazy, but I think that's my, it's my aunt. I said, okay. Or, or aunt. Is that what we say out here? Aunt? I think it's aunt out here. It's aunt yeah, I think it's, I, I say aunt, but who knows? <laughs> my, my Massachusetts came through for a moment. So we, uh, we were, we were talking. He goes, that's my aunt. I said, uh, I said, okay. I said, well, find out why she's communicating. And suddenly he, uh, he heard a voice and he, and he, he just, he put his hand up to his mouth and I, and I said, what's, what's going on? And he goes, that, that's my father. I said, your father. He said, that is, that's my, that was my father's voice that just came through. So he calls his, his, uh, partner up. I love these guys. So he calls his partner up, his partner comes up and he, and he goes, what? He goes, listen. So he starts asking questions. The voice comes through again and he goes, he goes, that's your father. He goes, I know that's my dad. Now they're both crying, like tears are just flowing. And I said, uh, I said, listen, I said, ask him to prove to you, ask him to call you a nickname that you only he and you, you would know. And so he did. And the nickname came through and, uh, and I didn't know it at first. I said, well, what was it? And he says, he says it was Chip. And I said, oh, I said, oh, okay. So they keep going and he's able to tell his father that he forgives him. Um, his father had committed suicide because he had found out that he had cancer. He didn't want his family to go through all that. And he ended up taking his own life. And it was years later that he found out why his father committed suicide. And here he was sitting there telling his father that he was not mad at him anymore. Uh, He understood what happened and that he forgave him. And his father stopped coming through after that. And, uh, you know, and, and it's, they're both crying. It was a very emotional moment. And, while they're crying, that woman's voice came back. And the woman said, Bruce loves you. And I was recording all of this on a, on a video recorder. So I do have the recording. So I have the whole thing on video. And um, when it said, Bruce loves you, I, I said to him, I said, did you, did you hear that? He said, what? I said, the woman just came back. She said, Bruce loves you. And he goes, that was my father's name. And I said, and I had no idea. This whole time, I had no idea what his father's name was because it was just dad, dad, dad. And uh, yeah, it said Bruce loves you, and uh, and I was floored because, you know, here it is for me. I'm like looking at this thing, going, why is this working? Why does this? You know, why is this even happening right now? I had no real reason that a cell phone app should allow ghosts to talk to us. Don't get it. So, the app itself just opens up the microphone on your phone, the speaker on your phone, and it plays the, the, the words. You ask for a color, it's not programmed to give you a color. It just keeps going through that randomizer. 
you count. It's not programmed to give you numbers. People have torn the program apart. There's nothing in there. It's just a soup of words. And when you start getting those answers back, you start asking, like, I'll, I will count. That's one of the things I like to do is I will start saying, I'm going to count. And when I stop, please say the next number. And you'll get numbers or the number back, you know, and it's then I know, all right, I'm actually communicating here and I'm not just getting the words from the program. And then, you know, I ask, I always ask, start asking control questions to make sure that I'm actually getting answers. Like I'll, I'll pull my shirt. I'll say, what color is the shirt I'm wearing? I won't say, can you say black? Because then I'm, I'm always skeptical that something's programmed to say that back. What color is the shirt I'm wearing? Boom. Okay. I have, well, there was one night that same app, we went around a room after telling everybody our name, after saying all of our names. And I walked over and I said, who's this guy? And I pointed to somebody and it said his name. And then I went to, so I went, who's this guy? Not in order. And it said his name. And it was the craziest thing because the, the people that were there had not ever experienced this before. So they were just, the people whose names were being said got freaked out because this was nothing they had ever experienced in their life. And they did not expect that to happen. So it was, uh, I've gone on far too long about this, but it was. It was no, this is great. Crazy. Well, one of the thoughts. It's crazy. It is crazy. And like, so I have, okay, I have like a bunch of questions. And one of them is, <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've heard things like, you know, when you do try to tap and maybe I'm, I don't know, I'm just going into too, too many buckets here, but when you do try to tap into a spirit or an energy or a ghost, or whatever it is, I've also been told that you can tap into the wrong side and the bad energies and the negative things. And that if you do choose to go this route, you have to be very careful and that you have to, I think, kind of maybe vocal, like verbalize what it is that you're trying to do. And you have to say something like, you know, I'm only allowing positive vibes or positive energies. I am not trying to, you know, and I, and do you have, do you have to do that? Do you have to open it up in a positive way and close it out? Like, is there kind of like an open and close process to this? Cause I'm, I'm thinking as people are listening to this, they're going to go, I want to try this at home. I, I just have a feeling that's going to happen, especially because of the time of year this is. Um, but also you, you mentioned before, so I guess it's a two part question. One, do you have to open and close? And then two, you said that something has to be happening like in your home. Like if there's nothing happening in your home, that's like suspicious. You said there's really no reason to investigate. So just, I guess maybe part one is, is there something going on in your home? You're hearing voices or something's going on, but if there isn't, don't even bother. Like, is that, so I guess that's question one. And question two is, do you have to open and close kind of your process? Yeah. So I, I, I do always open and close. I do. Unfortunately, I don't do it as often as I should, <laughs> but I do open and close. If I know I'm going into an intense investigation, I do all kinds of things first to protect myself. And then when I get to that location, I'm always very cautious about how we proceed. Um, I do like to involve the families. If I'm going to somebody's home to investigate, I do like to involve the families, but I make sure children are gone. I do not want children in the investigation. Um, that's a big vulnerability there. Uh, adults, I just make sure I, I caution them as we're going. Like you said, yes, you can tap into something. And fortunately enough, I've done this long enough and I've had the proper instruction along the way too. Plus my common sense is pretty, pretty good that if something doesn't quite quack like a duck, it's probably not the duck. So there are certain things that you should really pay attention to. If it feels like it's too good to be true, if it feels like you're getting all the right answers, that's probably a red flag. That's probably a danger zone because you're not going to always get all the right answers. I always cautious, pe caution people if they ask a question like, are you still in pain or do you, you might not oh, want to hear my that My plastic answer. water bottle just made a noise when you said that. That just cracked me right out. Did you hear that? Is it. there I something in the room that. right now? I'm sweating. <laughs> Okay, but, good um, spirits just, only. Just a water bottle expanding. Don't worry, it's okay. <laughs> okay, someone's um, coming through. <laughs> but so these things are 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 kind of there are things to, to pay attention to. Like I said, if it sounds it feels too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. Um, I, I'm I'm not a fan of people recreationally just being like, hey, I'm going to buy that app and I'm going to start doing this in my house and call a good team. Do some research. You know, I, I hear a lot of things about um, 
this is a pet peeve of mine. I told you there's a lot of things in this field that I wish would change. You can bring a plumber into your house, but you're not going to bring your, you know, your mailman in to fix your plumbing. Um, you want to have a good quality team or person come into your home. And there's a lot of teams out there that I, I, I give them an A for effort for trying, but they want to be on TV and they do more damage than good when they go into people's homes. Then there are the reputable teams that will come in, spend the time with somebody. And if they don't find anything, they don't find anything. If they, they're not going to go scare somebody and, and I'm really kind of breaking off on a tangent here, but there, there are, there are teams out there that are looking to make some money or make some fame and they don't know what the heck they're doing. And then there are other teams that are reputable. And I, I strongly recommend people that if you are going to bring in a paranormal team, there are easy ways to do a little bit of research on them. There are easy ways to find teams that have um, have good recommendations, things like that. And don't just jump at – if you go on their page, if you go to a website and you see a whole bunch of stuff with them selling mar- merchandise and stuff like that, probably keep looking. If you go onto a website and there are teams that have a bunch of evidence from cases that they've shown and good recommendations on there from people, that's maybe a team you want to make a phone call to. Uh, Most teams do have a a good way to get there. Now, going back to what we were just talking about, though, the layman who might just want to start trying to do something, I highly recommend that if you are going to do it, make sure you – Whatever you believe in, if you believe that that water bottle that just popped in your house is going to protect you, then you ask for protection from that water bottle. And you believe that it's going to protect you. Because if you don't believe, then it doesn't matter. You know, I, I people wear a cross. You know, I'm going to – you can pull out a cross. If I showed you a cross, but I don't believe in anything behind this cross, it's just a piece of metal. It doesn't matter. You know, it's, it's all it is, is that – you have to have faith and conviction behind whatever it is you're putting forth. Otherwise, you're leaving yourself wide open because there are things out there that are not uh, grandma wanting to let you know that she's upset that you didn't uh, put her china out and keep it stored in the attic. You know, there are things out there that are looking for a reason to cause problems. Um without attaching a religion to it. There's energies out there that have been here longer than we have ever been here. And they, they just like to wreak havoc upon us. So just always be cautious. I hope you're enjoying this episode. Next week, Mark will come back to the podcast to finish sharing his ghost hunting stories with you in part two of this conversation. So tune in next week so you don't miss a thing. Before you go, I need your help. If you're listening to the show on Apple Podcasts, scroll all the way down and give the Piece of Me podcast a positive rating and review. You can also support the podcast by subscribing to the show on Spotify, Apple, Pandora, or wherever you listen. To stay connected, follow the Piece of Me podcast on Instagram, TikTok, and at the website peaceofmepodcast.com.